Invented back in the 1960s, CMOS became the technology standard for integrated circuits in the 1980s and is still considered the most common form of semiconductor manufacturing technology today. Although it looks like the manufacturing process is gradually being replaced by FinFET technology, the basic principles of CMOS logic will probably remain with us for a long time to come. Today, almost every chip you see in your phones, gaming consoles or other consumer electronics is built with this logic. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. As we will see in this video, the word complementary describes the essential idea of these types of circuits. An idea that leads to small power consumption and is the basis of the triumphant success of CMOS circuits to this day. For this video, you should know some basics about MOSFETs, so if you want to catch up on these topics, you maybe want to have a look at some of our other videos first. Now let's start with some basics. CMOS circuits consist of pairs of MOSFET transistors, which switch at opposite input levels. Hence, we need NMOS and PMOS transistors, which have many different symbols. For this video, we will use these two simplified symbols because they convey all the information we need for our circuits. The first logic circuit we want to have a closer look at is the inverter. We will approach this problem first with a simple circuit consisting of a resistor and a MOSFET, after which we will have a look at the advantages of CMOS technology. As its name already suggests, the inverter inverts the input signal at the output. If the input level at the NMOS is high, said NMOS transistor will switch on and will pull the output potential to ground or low level. The supply voltage will cause a current to flow through the resistor resulting in losses. Inversely, when the input level is low, the NMOS is open and ideally no current will flow. Since there is no current, no voltage will drop at the resistor and the output is therefore pulled up towards the supply voltage. Logic circuits, similar to this one but with bipolar transistors, were used for the moon landing in the Apollo guidance computer in the 1960s. This resistor-transistor logic, or RTL for short, had some significant drawbacks. One was that these circuits consumed a lot of power since current always flows in one of the two logic states. A large resistor would help, but this reduces the possible output current on the one hand and consumes a lot of chip area on the other, which is why RTL cannot be built as small as CMOS. Another major problem is that the output voltage of the high level is highly dependent on the load. To show this, we will connect the resistor to ground at the output of the circuit and measure the voltage drop when the transistor is switched off. If this resistor is small in relation to the other one, the output voltage of the high level will be small too. As a result, the high level can no longer be interpreted as such. CMOS provides the solution for all these problems by replacing the resistor with a PMOS that complements the NMOS, hence complementary metal oxide semiconductor. If the gates of the two transistors are connected, we get a CMOS inverter. If we apply a high level at the input of the inverter, the NMOS closes again but the PMOS will stay open. Vice versa, by applying low level at the input, the PMOS closes and the NMOS opens. So in the static case, only one transistor is on at the time, providing a very low impedance, while the other one is off, providing a very high impedance. Only during switching from high to low or from low to high, 
current is flowing for a very short time across both transistors. This is called the dynamic power dissipation of the CMOS circuit and it is mainly dependent on the number of switching operations, in other words the switching frequency, and the supply voltage as it determines the maximum current during the switching operation. The supply voltage is also a significant factor for the so-called static power dissipation due to leakage current, which occurs because MOSFETs can never be switched off entirely. Therefore, in modern ICs, the supply voltage is kept as low as possible. We will cover some more complicated CMOS logic circuits in one of our other videos. For now, let's talk about another important concept also combining two complementary transistors known as transmission gate. These circuits are used as a kind of circuit breaker and can conduct or block in both directions, depending on the control signal. The transmission gate is composed of an NMOS and a PMOS transistor connected like this. Strictly speaking, the circuit needs an additional inverter, which as we already know, consists of two additional MOSFETs. Just as with the CMOS logic circuits, the bulk terminal of the NMOS is connected to ground and that of the PMOS to the supply voltage. If we now apply a high-level control signal to the gate terminal of the NMOS and therefore a low-level signal is applied to the PMOS due to the inverter, a conductive connection is established between the input and the output of the circuit. We can break this connection by applying low level as a control signal. Now the output will always float, regardless of what signal is applied to the circuit's input. Since the bulk terminal of the NMOS is permanently connected to ground, its parasitic diodes are always operated in reverse direction. The same is true for the PMOS and its bulk connection, which is permanently connected to the supply voltage. As a result, the transmission gate can be used in both directions. One problem of this circuit is its on resistance, which depends on the level of the input signal. In this figure, we see the resistance of the transmission gate that is switched on as a function of the input voltage. We see that the resistance of the NMOS increases with increasing input voltage, while that of the PMOS decreases at the same time. The total resistance during a transition of the input signal from low to high for a switched on transmission gate is shown here. We can see that the total on resistance depends on the channel voltage because the transistors conduct differently well for different voltages. Transmission gates can be found in many applications such as electronic switches, multiplexers, safety precaution on IC pins and all kinds of bus connections. In the last part of our first video on CMOS, we will deal with some inconveniences of CMOS circuits. As already mentioned at the beginning, CMOS circuits consume a lot of energy when switching. The resulting losses are called dynamic losses and are linearly dependent on the switching frequency as well as the load capacitance, which is usually caused by the gate capacitance of the subsequent logic gates. The dynamic losses also depend quadratically on the supply voltage, which is a very good reason to keep it as low as possible. A second factor is the static loss of the CMOS circuits. These are linearly dependent on the leakage current of the MOSFETs, which increases with increasing channel width and the supply voltage. Today, static losses pose a huge problem, accounting for over half of the total losses since the invention of the 50 nanometer technology. These losses cannot be avoided in CMOS and will probably lead to a technology change as with FinFETs or similar processes in the long run. 
A second inconvenient fact about CMOS circuits is their sensitivity to over voltages. This problem has been overcome to a certain extent by technical progress in protective circuits. Nevertheless, let's take a brief look at how the problem of the so-called latch up arises. If we look at the physical structure of a CMOS inverter, we can see some unwanted parasitic components within it. The different N and P doped wells create parasitic thyristors which can fire due to an overvoltage and destroy the CMOS inverter. If we draw these parasitic elements into an equivalent circuit, the problem becomes understandable. Here we see the parasitic thyristor T1, which can be ignited by a voltage spike at the input of the CMOS gate. The resulting current flow creates a voltage drop across resistor R2, which in turn ignites thyristor T2. The voltage drop that now occurs across resistor R1 causes thyristor T1 to open even further. This causes even more current flow through R2, in turn causing T2 to open further and so on. The process can no longer be stopped and leads to a defect or the complete destruction of the CMOS gate. One way to protect the CMOS device is to add additional diodes to the inputs and outputs. These start to conduct in the event of a positive or negative voltage peak and can thus prevent the CMOS device from being destroyed. However, these additional diodes also mean additional load capacitance and additional leakage current, which unfortunately in turn leads to higher power dissipation. This short excursion into the world of CMOS circuits should provide an overview of how CMOS logic with two transistors, like the inverter and the transmission gate, are constructed and which problems exist with regard to the power dissipation and protective circuits. In one of our other videos, we will deal with more complex CMOS logic circuits. I'm Michael with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyways, thanks for watching.